passage is God is in control. Really? Do you, do you get the gist of that title? God is in control. Really, 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 he's in control. You know, I, I mean, I never thought I would be alive uh, to see the world in the shape it's in. I, I'll just be honest with you. I thought that I'd been gone on to be with Jesus long before this, right? But this world's not doing anything different than what God, the sovereign God, said it would do. I mean, it's just right on track, right? We've got a lot to say about that. God bless. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to move briskly enough to get all the material in, but not so fast that we lose people here. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. Y'all know how I feel about Ephesians, right? Um, I ran into a sister the other day that used to be a part of the church back when uh, Greg was with us and um, a little bit after that. And she said, I want you to know I still keep all of my notes on the book of Ephesians. How many of you were here for the teaching on Ephesians? Yeah, we may need to do that again. But Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, read like this. In him we have obtained an inheritance. Can you say amen? We could stop right there and preach all night long. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Now, listen carefully. In past messages, I've talked about a number of strategies for living a life that's filled with the peace of God. Have I not? Have you heard me talk about the peace of God in our lives? One of the first messages that I preached here as the pastor had to do with this subject matter. So here's what I wrote. In past messages, I've talked about six strategies for living a life that is filled with the peace of God. I said that before we can live in the peace of God, we need to have peace with God. Amen? By placing our faith in Christ. And then we looked at those six strategies. Uh, let's look at them. Let's look at them. The first was understanding God's sovereignty. The first was understanding God's sovereignty. Next was to adopt a biblical mindset. How many of you know that your thinking needs to be dominated by the Word of God? I mean, this is just spiritual common sense. The third strategy is to pray about everything. You've heard me say these things many times, but they're worth revisiting. Fourth, we need to plan ahead... I'm going to say that again. Fourth, we need to plan ahead, but submit to the will of God, allowing him to modify our plans through life. Amen? I'm going to say that again. We need to plan ahead, but submit to the will of God, allowing him to modify our plans through life. It, it, you know, I have plans, I have strategies, I want to manage you know, the things, the resources that God's given me, at any time that God wants to modify any of that, he can have it. Amen? That's what I'm trying to say. And the fifth strategy, as I mentioned was, that I'd mentioned previously, was to live in obedience. And the last strategy was to live in anticipation of heaven and of God fulfilling his promises on earth in the meantime. Now, you've heard me say these things, maybe not in those identical words, but you've heard me say these things, and I would dare say many times. Many times you've heard me say those things. As I was reflecting on this message, I was convinced that God wanted me to spend a little more time on some of these before we get into the Christmas season. I'll tell you more about that later. To say the least, we talk ever so often about prayer here. Amen? We talk about prayer every now and then here, right? Oh, we talk about prayer all the time. Amen? So I said, to say the least, we talk every so often about prayer here. That's some humorous sarcasm. And about obedience quite frequently. Amen? So I thought we should spend time on the other four strategies. And today is the first message of that idea. All right? Today we're going to talk about God's sovereignty. The Bible talks 
in many places about God's sovereignty, but I have chosen just one passage to help us get a handle on the concept of this a little better. Before, but before we look at it and look at how it should affect us, let me give you a quick disclaimer. Listen carefully. There are multitudes of books written about this subject, and we're barely going to scratch the surface today. One service. One service about the sovereignty of God, that's not enough to cover the vastness of the subject. Amen? This is important to understand. But if you've known me for any length of time, you know that I'm more about being able to use something than about being able to have everything figured out. Do you understand what I just wrote there? It's important to understand that if you've known me for any length of time, you know that I'm more about being able to use something than about being able to have everything figured out. How many times have you heard me say, I don't have it all figured out, but I've got the book. Amen? And I'm not afraid to read the instructions. Amen? All right. For instance, I don't know all there is to know about redemption. I don't know everything there is to know about justification. I don't know everything there is to know about sanctification and all those other sanctions. <laughs> Whatever that word, how it fits. But I know that if you don't have Jesus, you ain't got any of that stuff. Do you see what it is, the things that I know? I don't know everything about all of those subjects, but I know that if you don't have Jesus, you don't have any of that. Amen? That's the simplicity of your pastor. All right? All right. And as it comes to the sovereignty of God, I don't pretend to understand it all. But I'm grateful for it. Do you hear what I just said? I'm grateful for it. And as you will see as we go through the message, it has a significant impact on how I go through life. All right? Again, Ephesians 1, 11 and 12 in a different version. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. So, what you say, what, what exactly does that mean? Listen carefully. Sovereignty basically means that God is in control of all things, whether we see or understand it. Another name for king is sovereign. Amen? In other words, God is sovereign, but sovereign because he's the king. Amen? The king of creation. Everything that goes on is under his control. All right? I want to begin by pointing out two things to keep in mind about God's sovereignty. And this is just the introduction. Number one, his purposes prevail. His purposes prevail. Look at verse 11 of our passage, particularly the part where it says, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. The key to understanding the sovereignty of God is to get a hold of the fact that God is working everything out to fit his purposes. We just benefit from it. Colossians 1 in verse 16, the latter part of it says, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. It's a paraphrase, but everything got started in him and finds it pers its purpose in him. That's everything. Guess how much everything is? That's right, all of it. Thank you. And he's using it all for his purposes. This means that no matter who's in office, no matter who's running around loose in the world, no matter what the economy does, God is in control, and that ultimately, it's for His glory. Remember when I said at the beginning of the message that I don't necessarily understand everything about God's sovereignty? This is one of those areas I just don't get. Listen to me now. I don't understand how God can use famine or war or crime and all that stuff. But the Bible says it's so. Amen? But you know, you know what all this tells me? 
it tells me two things primarily. First, that no matter what goes on in this old world, he's got it under control and he's using it for his purposes. Do you hear what I just said? That no matter what's going on in this world, he's got it under control and he's using it for his purposes. Nothing catches him by surprise. Second, it tells me, listen carefully, because this one, this one whew, runs deep fast. Second, it tells me that God can use even me. And when you're a short, a little overweight, grain-haired guy, uh, sometimes with a high squeaky voice that means something, uh, know what I mean. Listen to me. And of course, that also means that he can use you for his purposes as well. Amen? You might be sitting here this afternoon wondering if God can use you. And I'm here to tell you that he can. Because he has a purpose for everything and everyone. The purpose of our existence and all that happens is to further his purpose. You're going to hear it over and over and over again. How many times have you heard me say, we got caught up in this for a while and it's important to remember, it's not about us. It's about him. It's all about him. Amen? God so loved the world that he sent his only son so we could have eternal life. Why? Because our salvation serves his purpose. It's for him. It's about him. And just what is that purpose? Next point. His purpose is his glory. God's purpose is his glory. Our salvation serves to bring glory to God. It's his good pleasure to offer forgiveness and a home in heaven. It brings him glory. Let me say something that is extremely important to understand. And I need you to listen up here. Because many people, including many Christians, operate under a false assumption. Are you ready? We are not the purpose of all things. He is the purpose of all things. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. God's purposes flow around him and his glory, not around us and ours. Do you understand that? God provides wonderful things for us and offers us a full and abundant life, but it's because it pleases him and brings him glory. Everything is under his control, and everything happens so that he will be glorified. That is his purpose. Now, all this would be nice and academic if it weren't for the question that people are asking all over the world today when they consider the sovereignty of God. If God's really in control, you know where I'm going? What about the bad stuff? It's a tricky area. The heart of the question lies in another question. Does God make bad things happen? Now, this is important. And if so, how does this work for his glory? Allow me to offer you two very brief answers to this. These answers on the surface may not seem to give you satisfaction, but I hope they will give you some direction in grasping the idea that God is in control no matter what. The first one is... Listen carefully. There is a difference between what God causes and what God allows. I'm telling you, that's, that's life-changing. You let that sink down inside. There's a difference between what God causes and what he allows. I can tell you right now, a lot of the bad stuff in our lives, God didn't cause it. We did. But can God use it for his glory? Yes, he can. Scripture talks about episodes when God brought earthquakes, famine, and other disasters that took the lives of a number of people, and it was always in that time in judgment. Does that make sense? But I think God allows things to happen that are not what we would like to see happen, but that serve the higher purposes we are unable to see. 
For instance, I'm not convinced from Scripture that God causes all sickness in people or that all sickness is a judgment from God. Some think many things are because of the judgment of God. I think that's possible. Most likely even probable, but I don't see anything in Scripture that tells me God judges innocent babies because mom and dad were foolish in their habits. Now, listen, let me clarify. The baby may suffer a natural physical consequence of the actions of their parents. God's allowed that, but I don't believe God necessarily caused it. Why does he allow such things? I don't know. I don't know. Except that somehow they serve his purpose because I know it's all about his purpose. To bring him glory in the end. Again, he is aware of everything. Don't you wish everyone could hear this sermon? He can stop it. He can stop if it would serve his purpose. Think about that. But he chooses not to for the time being. Do you wake up in the morning wondering, God, you know, you see the news and, and you see what's unfolding. You go, Father, what in the world? It's just, they're just doing exactly what he said they would do. You read Daniel. You read Revelation. Amen? You, you, you read the words of Jesus who talked about the end times and, you, and the words of Paul and the words of every great leader in the word of God. They all had something to say about what people were going to be like in the last days. Amen? So for now, I need to believe that God knows what he's doing, and I can do that because of the next point. God sees the big picture. Can you say amen? In Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. No kidding. Amen? It's God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Can you say thank God tonight? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your way, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So let me use this as an illustration. Imagine yourself as a pilot flying over mountainous terrain. And as you're flying, you look down and you see two vehicles driving down the highway. The first vehicle is a semi-tractor trailer pulling his load up and down the highway. The second vehicle is a sports car driven by a guy who's got better things to do than be stuck behind a semi that can't always maintain the speed limit up and down the mountain grades. Well, what you as a pilot can see that the drivers can't is that there's no traffic coming the other way. The car could easily pass the truck with no danger. The problem is that neither the truck nor the car driver can see that. They can only see what's immediately in front of them. They can't see the big picture. You see, we only see things from the perspective of the created, not the creator. We don't see the big picture. Only God does. And you know what else? You're not going to want to hear this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. God does not owe you an explanation. You see, God's not answerable to us. Rather, we are answerable to Him. God is not obligated to us. We are obligated to Him. And we need to understand that if our Heavenly Father chooses for now to keep things as a mystery, that is His prerogative. Let's recap for just a minute. God's sovereignty is characterized by the fact that God's purposes prevail and that his purposes are related to his glory above all else, including our own salvation. Did you hear that? We've also looked at the fact that in regard to God's sovereignty, in light of all the bad stuff, there are some things that God causes, some things that he allows, and most importantly, he sees the big picture from the perspective of the Creator where we see things from the perspective of the created. So now what? What do we do with all this information? Number one, avoid attitudes of resignation and fatalism. You know, I'm telling you, I, I, I talk to so many people who don't have any grasp of the truth in this message at all. 
and, and they're drowning in a sea of resignation and fatalism. They don't see any way out. And you know what? Let's just face it. It might be over a, a sea of problems like whether the light bill is going to get paid or whether the car payment is going to get made or whether the roof on the head is going to be... Listen to me carefully. God, God's in charge, you know? And of all the things that we're concerned about and buried under, those are, should not be the things. So, well, Brother Dennis, you've never... You've never been kicked out in the street before. Let me tell you where I've been before. I remember being in Alaska and, and my family down south, me trying to scrape money together to pay the bills and medical bills and feed my family and help take care of them. And, uh, and I would go to Burger King at, at, at 8 o'clock in the evening because I had to be to work at 9 on the night shift cleaning a laundry. And I could write a check at Burger King in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I would buy food and write a check and hand it to them. Go work all night long. And one of the deals was I made X number of dollars an hour and I could keep all of the change I found under the agitators and the washers. And this was the second largest washeteria in all of North America. So I would get enough money together out of those washers and dryers. And the next morning before I'd go to sleep, I'd go to the bank as soon as it opened, and deposit enough money to cover the check I wrote at Burger King the night before. Do you understand what I'm saying? And many of you have been in places like that in your lifetime. God was still in control. Amen? Avoid attitudes of resignation and fatalism. In view of this, I don't throw up my hands and say, oh, well, case, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No sense doing anything like telling others about Jesus, working for social justice or peace or anything like that. And there's absolutely no sense in praying for crying out loud, God's agenda is set, so why bother? Because God commands us to do these things. Talk to him, amen? You see, he uses them for his purposes. We're all his tools to accomplish his purposes. That should be opportunity not for resignation, but for excitement that you can be a partner, if you will, in the work of Almighty God. Amen? That was a pretty powerful statement. God works and moves through people to bring about good things and to bring as many people as possible to faith in Christ. Why? For His glory. Is the answer to everything about God. For His glory. You know, I still ask God about and for stuff in prayer. I'm the only one, right? Even though God's not answerable to me, I still ask Him about stuff. I just ask nothing that He... Uh, I just ask nothing that he's, he's under no obligation. You understand what I'm saying? And if He does give me insight into something, it's because He is showing me grace. The very sermon I'm preaching tonight is because of God's grace. What if God never pointed me at anything? What if God never said anything to me? We just all starve when we came to church to get something from the Word. I don't believe, and I say this because of my excitement about Him and His glory. I believe He's faithful to us in this church in His Word. He's faithful to us. Don't slip into resignation and fatalism. Jump into activity for the kingdom. Next. Second thing, rejoice and relax knowing that you're in good hands. Do you think the plan of God is bad for you? Do not ever assume that the plan of God is bad for you because that's totally and completely contrary to the Word of God. You see, folks, there is no denying that these times we're living in are trouble. That's why it's so important that you know how to live in the peace of God. Understanding better this whole thing about God's sovereignty does a long, goes a long way to doing that. In the context of what we've talked about here today, it means that we can rejoice and relax knowing that no matter what happens, God is in control, even if I can't see it. Now listen to me. You're not going to like this next line. You're not going to like it. And I'm not trying to speak it into existence. I'm just trying to tell you, you know, is there any limit to what can go wrong in this world? In this situation. Listen. 
Even if nuclear war started today, God would still be in control. Did you hear what I said? Even if nuclear war started today, God would still be in control. A new law could be passed in America, like it is in other countries, that makes it illegal for you to be a Christian or own a Bible or worship in public. And you know what? God would still be in control. It wouldn't be because God lost control. That's what I'm trying to say. Amen? Your personal world could fall apart, and as hard as that would be, God would still be in control. You know, we Americans are pretty spoiled. It wouldn't take much to, to disrupt, you know. You remember how one president said, Eisenhower, I think it was, said there needs to be a pot, a chicken in every pot. You remember that? Now there needs to be a color TV, flat screen color TV, and a microwave in every home. You understand what I'm, I'm saying? For us to be comfortable, for us to be happy. Now there's color TVs throughout the house and more than one microwave oven. Because there may be more than two hot dogs to heat up. Amen? So, your personal world could fall apart. And as hard as that would be, God would still be in control. Can you believe that? I mean really believe that. It's not enough to just believe it in your mind. It needs to be weighed down deep inside. Amen? I call it in your spiritual gut. Amen? Can you claim that for yourself today? And if not, are you willing to let God do something in your life right now to help you with it? See, that's another thing. People, they're not willing to let God do anything. Do you know that, that, that this doesn't bother me? I'm not saying that I want this to be the case. You know, I, I want God to do something that's unique with us. Amen? But I remember being in a church where when the worship service came up, um, you, you, the worship team would start singing. Everybody just get up and come and worship God around the altar. They would get everything around the altars. And they didn't really, really sit down and relax until the word was being given. See what I'm saying? But ooh, we, we don't want to do that. It's uncomfortable. God wants us to step out of our comfort zone. Amen? And quit caring what other people think. Amen? Just care about what he thinks. So I said, can you claim that for yourself today? And if not, are you willing to let God do something in your life right now to help with that? And you know what we're going to do? We're just going to pray about that. We're just going to pray about it. Amen? Look, look, look. Don't get upset about all this. This should bring a smile to your spiritual face for me to say this to you. But maybe you're sitting there and you can think, man, just this last week I let myself get buried under something, you know, something that I really didn't need to let it get under my skin, right? I, I'll tell you, I heard dynamic testimonies this week too. You wouldn't believe, you know, your sister Kathy, we love you, we're praying for you, but your, your testimony about the last couple of weeks was so fitting for what I'm talking about tonight. That, that no matter what goes on around us, it doesn't change God in our life. And that, you know, God's meeting needs. I, I'm going to steal some thunder uh, tonight, you know, because I know these testimonies. My, my nephew, Mark Wilson Jr., and his wife, Sandra, have been through a lot in the last year, year and a half, you know. And, and, and after coming out of the pandemic, all of those jobs that were out there for medical providers dwindled this emergency medical response dwindled and mark didn't have a job and mark would try to go do training and get ready for a job only to either uh, fail in the training or get the training and then there's no jobs to fit that need right and so uh, recently he went to cyber security school sounds like there'd be a lot of jobs only there in the lower 48 and he didn't feel led of god to tear up roots and go down there. So he said, well, God, I'm just going to have to wait here. You know, and um, it, the pressure got, you know, got hot in the kitchen. You understand what I'm saying? And it gets tough on a young married couple, right? Only they, um, you know, they, 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 they're sticking with God. They're, you, you know what I'm saying? They're not being bowled away, blown away, or, or any of that. And so I said, well, you need to tell me 
Tell me something that I can pray about. And here's what he said. He said, well, I'm facing, I'm facing a choice between the rent or the car getting fixed. Now, if standing there at that moment, God had said, fix that. You, you fix that. I'd have fixed it. But God didn't say a word to me. So how many of you know I could be out of line if I step out and just do it because I can? I said, come on, God, come on. You know I love him like a son. What do you think I would be willing to do for him and Sandra, right? God didn't say a word, so I didn't say a word other than, well, I'm going to be praying about that. Let's pray about that, you know. And so, you know, it, you know, it puts pressure on a young married couple, financial issues, right? So, um, I get this call from Mark a number of weeks ago. He said, I have a friend. He went to work for FedEx. FedEx is running short of help. I didn't know it. He said, my friend told them, I know a guy looking for a job. So HR at FedEx phoned Mark. <laughs> All right? And said, you get in here, fill out the paperwork, and we'll move on this. We'll put you to work. Right? So he went in, filled out all the paperwork. Well, then the background checks and everything. How many of you know that no matter what good intentions are, sometimes things grind to a halt? So, well, why, God? Why for my glory? Do you hear what I just said? For his glory, right? It didn't clear up. It didn't clear up. It didn't clear up. It didn't clear up. And then, the, and then here was something that they were looking at, a FedEx job that God was clearly providing for them, but in his time, not in my time, not in Mark's time, not in anybody else's time, in God's time, right? And so he calls me the other day. Fin he said, finally, they, they called me, and I'm in the parking lot at FedEx. I'm about to go in and start my orientation and go to work. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. All right. Listen, listen. That's not all. He calls me the next day. And, and, and look, I, I, I'm not, I don't have the liberty to share all the details. You understand what I'm saying? But God, he calls me back. He said, in my bank account right now, um, I didn't expect it. I didn't see it coming, but God used uh, a mechanism. And, and it wasn't that the bank made a mistake and he's got to give the money back. You understand what I'm saying? Bank didn't make a mistake. Uh, uh, there was an entity out there that was involved in supposedly getting money to Mark and Sandra that he had coming to him because of his military background. That's foot dragging, foot dragging, foot dragging. It's the federal government. Not God, but the federal government. All of that back money appeared in his checking account just like that. Just like that, right? So the rent's paid. The car's going to get fixed. The car payment's going to get made. Groceries are going in the house. All, but, but, but. You say, well, come on, God. You know, it would have been a lot easier if you did this six weeks ago. You understand what I'm saying? That's what we are like. It's not what God is like. But the lessons learned for me, for Mark, for my family, for his family, you can't put a price on that. You can't put a price on that. God is sovereign. He's sovereign. Amen? You may, you may be thinking, you know, I mean, I, 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 I wondered how, Lord, I've made all kinds of rearrangements to be able to take a great big cut and pay so I could come be your pastor. And none of it was needed. You folks love, love me and Ruthie and you take good care of us. Thank you. You, you. you do. God bless you. Thank you. If you ever think for one moment that I either take that for granted or I don't appreciate it, you're mistaken. But really, in reality, it's for his purposes. Amen? Amen. All right, I, I need to pray. I need to pray. Amen. If we found ourselves in the last few days or the last few weeks or the last few months even being tempted to get buried in, you know, the fatalistic ideas and, and depression over what you don't have, when God tells you, I love you, I'm going to take care of this. I, I've got this in, under control. I'm in control. I'll take care of this. And yet we continue to lay awake at night. It's not spiritually healthy. Lay awake at night, all right, to talk to him. Amen? 
Don't lay awake at night because I just can't sleep. I don't know how God's going to work all this out. Do you know that God never dropped one sweat drop over me and what I was facing in life? Jesus did so I wouldn't have to. You understand what I'm saying? Even great drops of sweat that were like blood for me, right? But since then, no sweat for Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? Once again, God never stood up. Jesus never stood up to throw Satan out of heaven. He just told two angels. Amen? Michael and Gabriel, go get him, throw him out. And they went and threw him out. God never even stood up. There's no record in the word of God that he stood up or that Jesus even stood up. You understand what I'm saying? God never broke a sweat meeting one of our needs. He was, it was never in any doubt for him. Were you going to wait as long as he wanted you to wait? You bet you will. You have and you will. Amen? You know what? When you just begin to shake your head and say, no, 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 devil. This is all in God's hand. Stand up with me in Jesus' name. Stand up. Stand up. We've got to go to the Lord in prayer. You know, I feel like that tonight. For the first time in ways I haven't seen in a long time, this church reached out to God in praise and worship. This church reached out to God. And we just need to keep doing that. Amen? And then you'll start being surprised about the revelation of the purposes of God in the existence of Life Spring Bible Church. Did you just hear what I said? How many of you could use some revelation about the purposes of God in Life Spring Bible Church? I got both hands up. Amen. I got both hands up. Father, in Jesus' name. Mm. Lord, first of all, I want to thank you for the altars in this church. Thank you for the altars in our home. The altars in our life that are strictly set up for us to be with you, talk to you, love you, adore you, praise you, worship you. And to thank you for that there's not a need in our life that you're not already aware of and that you're already working on it. So to spend less time praying about the need and thanking you for the way you've got it all in the palm of your hand, Lord, is what I want to do. It's what we want to do. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives in this place tonight. Forgive us, Father, for the sin of doubt, fear, and unbelief. Help us to grow, Lord, in Jesus' name, to mature even. Good word. To mature, Father, in the waiting processes of our life as we wait and watch and live in anticipation of just how you're going to work all of this out. Father, thank you for teaching us that it's less important for us to play, pray for and about stuff and more important that we just praise you and worship you. That it's all moving according to your plan. Nothing's getting out of hand. As far as you're concerned, nothing's getting out of hand. Doesn't matter what my eyes see. Doesn't matter what my ears hear. You're the God of everything. Forgive us, Father, for the sin of doubt, fear, and unbelief when it comes to our relationship with you. Forgive us for whatever sin uh, that we might be pursuing. In Jesus' name, we know that you are the one that sets people free. We can't set ourselves free. You set us free, but we have to trust you, Lord. Thank you for the cleansing blood of Jesus, your Son. It was shed some 2,000 years ago, and still it has not diminished one iota in its power to save, to cleanse, and to manifest grace in our lives. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for what you're doing in this place when we gather together in your name. And yes, Lord, when it's even two or three of us gathered in your name, you're there in the midst of us. We do not fret. We do not fear. We know that you're working in our lives, Father. I want to thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in Kathy's life. Touch her spiritually, physically, mentally, Father. In Jesus' name, give her peace that passes all understanding. Thank you for meeting all of her needs, all of the girls' needs. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. 
for what you're doing in Mark and Sondra's life. Thank you, Father, that you've just blessed them with enough money to walk out of the woods financially. But, Lord, it's more important that we learn that that's the kind of God you are. And you work out all things, Father, for your glory, not even our glory. We benefit from it. I thank you for that, Father. But it's all about your glory. Lord, in Jesus' name, don't let us walk out of this place tonight and forget this message. Help us to carry it with us everywhere we go. Let it have its perfect work in our lives. Let truth rule and reign supreme, we pray in Jesus' name. I bind the powers of Satan in the name of Jesus that would try to come against us and keep this seed uh, from growing, taking root in our hearts and lives and the soil of our hearts. Father, we water this seed with the power of prayer. Fertilize it, Father, in Jesus' name, because we're asking you to. And not let any circumstance of this world steal this seed from our heart and lives, Father. Lord, if we learn this, we know that we will truly be warriors in the kingdom that will wield the name of Jesus like the weapon that you gave it to us to be to deal with the powers of darkness. All for your glory. It's about you, Father. We benefit from it, Lord. Father calls LSBC Ministries to be everything that you want it to be. Not, not what we think it should be or how it should be or how it should look, but let it be what you want it to be. May we never be dissatisfied with that, Lord. Father, thank you for letting me pastor this church. I know it's only by your grace. Teach us all, we pray, in your word. May we settle down in the truth, Father, that everything you do is for your glory and that we benefit from every part of it, Lord. There's no part of it we don't benefit from. Thank you for loving us the way you do. Go with us as we depart this place tonight, Father. In Jesus' name, may we carry the word with us everywhere we go. In Christ's name, we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you. Fellowship together before you leave.